Have you ever experienced that sensation where you see someone and you're pleased to see them and then you find out that they actually died at the moment that you saw them? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are rattling through October at quite a steady pace at this point, and I hope that you're well. We are continuing with the Death Omen theme that we started last week with the Ben Nia. And we're going to be having a look at the fetch from Irish folklore today. And obviously it is, like I say Irish folklore, it does actually appear in English folklore as well. And I am just going to jump straight into the episode because there's not really much point for having a massive introduction on this one. Now, as I said, as I said last week, there are quite a lot of legends and superstitions and folklore dedicated to stuff to do with when a person is going to die. And this is a really interesting one because the fetch is essentially this shadowy double who appears at the point of a person's death, but to someone else. So according to the folklore, the fetch appears to a third person just as someone dies or is about to, and the witness believes it to be the person that they know, except the person should be many miles away at the time. Now, some stories do claim that the fetch will disappear along hallways or alleyways if a mortal tries to follow it, Because it's not actually a ghost, it's not even the actual person themselves, it's just a copy of them. And no one really knows why it takes that form. And it is also, I should point out, rarely malevolent in nature. I can't find any examples of stories where someone's been injured by a fetch. Now, Georgia Dunham Kelchner actually defines the fetch as, and I quote, the inherent soul, the accompanying counterpart or representation of a living person, end quote. So essentially, at the point of death, the soul travels beyond the body and appears to a loved one. Whether it's through panic or to give reassurance, nobody actually knows. Now for Andrew Black, and I quote, The fetch may even bear the signs of how the person will die. The movie series Final Destination could be considered to be about an elaborate fetch scenario, and much like in the films, the victim will usually die as predicted by the fetch, if not in exactly the same manner. End quote. But as with all things folklore, it's not always that straightforward, because incidentally, if a person sees a fetch in the morning, they themselves will have a long life. Yet if the apparition appears at night, the person faces a swift death. So, ouch. So let's find out a little bit more about them. So where does the name Fetch come from? Well, it's largely an Irish term, but English antiquary and lexicographer Francis Gross actually claimed it as a Northern English term in his Provincial Glossary of 1787. Whereas in the Dublin Penny Journal, JLL notes that, and I quote, There is no accounting for the coming of this forerunner of death. There is no tracing it to any defined origin, end quote. So some believe that it actually refers to a figure who fetches souls. Now, the fetch appears in most English folklore from the 18th century onwards as the double, which is why I think sometimes it doesn't appear because it's basically mislabeled. And I have actually written about doubles and doppelgangers over on the Folklore Thursday blog, and I'll drop a link below so you can go and read more about those there. And obviously we've looked at doubles through both reflections and shadows before as well. But the concept of the fetch made its Irish literary debut in the early 19th century, and it popped up in an 1825 story, The Fetches, by John and Michael Bannham. That being said, the concept actually dated to a true, and I am saying that in air quotes, English ghost story published in 1705. Now, Roger Clark discusses this particular tale in his excellent book, A Natural History of Ghosts, 500 Years of Hunting for Proof, and in it, Mrs Margaret Bargrave sits at home in Canterbury one September day. As the clock strikes noon, her friend Mary Veal comes in. They chat for a bit, and it's quite important here that Mrs Veal doesn't want Mrs Bargrave to, like, kiss her or touch her in any way. But anyway... Mrs. Veal essentially consoles Mrs. Bargrave about her marital discord. And she then asks Mrs. Bargrave to write some letters on her behalf, including instructions about who should get items from her jewellery collection, which is a bit of a strange request, but, you know, just go with the story. Now, almost an hour and three quarters passed before Mrs. Veal finally takes her leave. And it no doubt comes as quite a shock 
when Mrs Bargrave discovers the next day that Mrs Veal had actually died right around the time she popped in for tea. Now, the story actually comes from an anonymous pamphlet published in 1705, and I'm going to give its full title because it's amazing in the way that only 18th century titles can be amazing. But its full title is A True Relation of the Apparition of One Mrs Veal the Next Day After Her Death to One Mrs Bargrave at Canterbury, the 8th of September, 1705. That's literally the whole title. And many people actually attribute it to the writer Daniel Defoe, and Robert D. Stock notes its place as the first modern ghost story. Now, the tale aims for a sense of realism that's largely absent from earlier stories. And the narrator actually assures us that he knows Mrs. Bargrave personally so he can vouch for her reputation. And in a lot of ways, this helps us to feel as though the story may really be true because it appears to have happened to someone the author knows. This does take us vaguely towards the urban legend where people always say that the story happened to a friend of somebody that they know. Whereas in this case, obviously, it, 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 he does say that he knows her. But it is quite interesting where that particular little strand seems to stop. And the story as a whole is very important to the development of ghost stories because it actually lacks a moral, as previous ghost stories had had, because usually they were used as some kind of like teaching tool. And in this one, instead, rather than having a moral, it adds a twist. And that's that Mrs Veal was actually dead at the time of the visit. And this replaces that need for a moral. And the author also gives us a backstory. And in this one, it looks at the parental neglect that the two women had suffered when they were children. And this particular psychological baton would later be picked up as part of the gothic storytelling mode. So it's really interesting how this idea from folklore has then jumped into fiction, which is then repackaged as being a true story. And then it kind of jumps back into fiction again, which you, you do have to be careful with ghost stories because... The ghost stories that people tell each other about what they've seen do tend to mirror what people are reading at the time, which is why ghosts change quite a lot. And there's no people don't see you know, the, the, the classic image of, you know, like the, the person in a sheet. People don't see ghosts that look like that anymore because that's not what appears in the stories, if that makes sense. So it is quite interesting how that happens. But it is quite unlikely that Defoe invented this particular story because instead I think it comes from a popular form of tale that's essentially passed around the population. And the reason why I say that is that different variations exist around the British Isles and the stories often appear in quite popular anecdotes and you'll generally hear them on ghost hunts and walking tours and the format is always the same. Person A speaks to or sees person B. They later discover that person B had actually died at the time that they saw them often many miles away. And indeed, there is one version of the story situated in St Andrew's Churchyard in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, my hometown. And here, the sexton had a sweetheart named Charlotte, and they'd argued and parted bitterly on this particular day. Eventually, the sexton felt bad about what had happened, so he decided he would call on her and apologise, and hopefully everything would be fine. And as he was locking up the church one day, he spotted her in the graveyard. Now, it's not a big graveyard, I should point out. It's quite small, but that's beside the point. And she's moving among the, the tombstones wearing her favourite blue dress. So the sexton obviously smiled. It was like, yes, excellent, Charlotte's come to see me. I can go and apologise now and everything will be fine. Or would it? So he called out to her and she completely ignored him. And eventually she disappeared into the shadows. And he went round the churchyard looking for her. Maybe she was hiding somewhere. Maybe it was a game of some sort. But he couldn't find her. And he couldn't find her in the streets around the church either. So he, got, he went home, confused about what had just happened. Because that is like a literal example of ghosting someone, essentially. Now, the following day, he hurried away to her house to call on her. Because he's like, I'm going to need to speak to her. I need to sort this out. This is really weird. And when he arrived, the shades were drawn and the house was all quiet. And he finally managed to find out from one of the servants that poor Charlotte had died the day before at the exact time that the sexton saw her. And you guessed it, she was wearing her favourite blue dress at the time. Now, this particular story is quite sad and she is known as poor Charlotte. It is difficult to find any details about who the sexton was or indeed when this happened, which does really make you kind of doubt its veracity because we don't have, we know her name, but we don't know her surname, so we can't track down where she was living or anything like that. And it's quite interesting as well because of the fact that of all the people that she could have appeared to, she picks him, so the person that she'd been fighting with, so she clearly still had feelings for him and she wanted to see him one last time and, and, and that was where she kind of projects herself, as it were, 
to go and see him. It's all very sad. The, the, of course, the legend is then expanded slightly in the way that these things always are to the idea that she apparently still wanders around the graveyard and you may catch a glimpse of blue while you're in there. I never have, because obviously I've looked. But that's the story. So you will find these all over the country. And I've even had people comment on my blog with like really weird versions that have happened to them, which is really interesting that this is the kind of folklore which persists even now. And I should point out that the fetch actually bears some similarities to the Norse concept of the philia. Again, I might be pronouncing that wrong, so apologies if I am. And unlike the fetch, the philia didn't represent specific people, but it still acted as a portent of death sometimes, so not always. So the word philia actually translates as to accompany, and for some people, the philia takes an animal form based on the first animal to appear after a birth, and it then accompanies the person throughout their life, a bit like the demons in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy. Now, I was born during the Witching Hour, as I've said before, so who knows what my philia would be? Probably a bat of some description, which, quite frankly, would say quite a lot. Now, other people believed that the philia was whatever animal ate the afterbirth, so obviously, as you can imagine, quite a lot of them took the form of carrion animals. And some people also believed that the type of animal indicated the personality that the person would have. Obviously, as you might imagine, cats were quite common as a philia. So seeing your own philia apparently heralded your death. So it's quite interesting that it accompanies you through life, but you're not allowed to look at it. The only time this was different is if your philia took the form of a woman, in which case you could expect good luck because female philia were considered a good luck sign for the whole family. So that's always worth bearing in mind. And considering the fact that the first animal you would technically have seen after birth would have probably be your mother, that would, that would probably explain quite a lot. But here we are obviously looking at the concept of people seeing the fetch and predicting a death of some description. And there are obviously various examples of famous people having apparently seen a premonition of their own death. And Abraham Lincoln apparently reported a dream that appeared to foretell his assassination. And even Elizabeth I allegedly saw a corpse laid out on her bed. Somehow she summoned the strength to get close enough to be able to recognise that the corpse was her. And she died soon after. Now these aren't quite the same as a fetch. Because the fetch appears at the point of your death to someone else. So it's no longer a premonition because at that point there's really nothing that you can do about them. As you might imagine there are quite a lot of stories about the fetch around the time of the First World War and you can obviously work out why. That being said, there is an example of a famous fetch encounter from the 16th century where the English poet John Donne apparently saw his wife's fetch in Paris and the apparition held a newborn baby. Donne knew that it heralded nothing good and he actually learned that his wife had given birth to a stillborn child at the time that he'd seen the fetch. So is the fetch actually a death omen or not? Now I know what you're thinking, if the fetch is a death omen, why don't we see one every time a person dies? And it is a good question. And JLL has a possible answer for that. And I quote, It is most frequently thought to be seen when the fated object is about to die a sudden death by unforeseen means, and then it is to be particularly disturbed and agitated in its motions. End quote. So basically, the reason why people see them sometimes and not others is because of the fact there's been some kind of trauma associated with their passing. And it's the trauma then that causes the fetch to go and appear to someone else, not just simply the fact that you've died. They're also, I should point out, not an omen of your death unless you happen to see your own. And obviously seeing your own double was always believed to be a harbinger of doom for yourself. But fetches do herald the death of someone that you care about elsewhere and they don't even need a banshee to announce it. So I am curious to know if you've had any fetch stories. Now, when I first posted this blog post a couple of years ago before I've expanded it into this podcast episode now, I did have two people left comments on the blog post and one guy pointed out that his father-in-law had told him a story during the Second World War that he'd been woken up by something and he'd looked up and he'd seen his uncle who was away fighting the war sort of at the end of the bed and he told him to go back to sleep everything was okay and obviously the, the, this this guy had then asked well why are you here and again he said it's okay just go to sleep and then the following day the news had arrived that this uncle had been killed the day before in battle and obviously he then told his parents what had happened and they said it was probably a nightmare obviously bearing in mind the fetch folklore that we've been looking at it is also possible that he is basically seen his uncle's fetch then somebody else posted a comment, Kimberly, saying that after her father died and had been buried, he'd actually appeared to her sister and spoken with her at night about how he loved her and she shouldn't be sad. 
Now, I think in this case, that sounds more like just a ghostly visitation rather than a fetch, because fetches don't generally talk, they're just seen. But it does just go to show that obviously these kind of figures do tend to reappear to people who meant something to them in life. So if you have ever experienced one of these fetch stories, please do let me know, because I am interested in how often this particular phenomena still happens even now. So that would be really cool uh, if you could let me know if you've experienced anything like that yourself. Next week, we are going to take a slight detour away from the death omens. We're going to go and meet Charon, the ferryman over the river Styx, who would take people into the Greek underworld where they could then pass on and, and do whatever it was that they wanted to do in the underworld. So we're going to go and meet him because he is quite closely associated with death and so on. But he's also quite an interesting character as well. So I hope that you'll join me for that next week. I do also want to point out that the Fabulous Folklore podcast now has its own mascot. And it's the rather marvellous plague doctor that was made for me by holly at the center for folklore myth and magic now he doesn't have a name and i thought it would be rather fun if we actually had a competition to name him so i've got a link below where you can drop your suggestion of a name for the plague doctor you will of course have your entry and your name and any website or anything like that read out on the podcast and you will also win a paperback copy of my short story collection black dog and other stories where all the stories are essentially based on something to do with folklore. So if you're interested in entering that competition, please do check the link below for the Plague Doctor naming competition. Can't wait to see what people come up with. And I hope that you have a marvellous week ahead, and I will see you soon. Cheerio! Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com, and that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images, and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead, and I'll see you soon. Cheerio!